Hello again, this is Brian Copeland talking. Welcome to another edition of Copeland's Corner. If all goes well, a little bit later on, we'll be joined by a distinguished panel of comics and we'll talk about some of the news of the week. Um, this being the holiday season, we're going to start uh, t- today's podcast by doing something a little bit different. We usually don't have guests at, uh, at the top of the podcast, especially guests talking about something that is festive. So uh, I decided, as I said, it's the holiday season, so let's do it. So uh, coming up uh, on December 17th, let me make sure I have this information correct, Sunday, December 17th, if you were here, uh, where I am recording in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area at uh, the, Chabot, the Chabot College Performing Arts Center in Hayward, California, the Bay Philharmonic has a special program called A Holiday Spectacular. So here to talk with us about that is the artistic director and the conductor of the Bay Philharmonic, Zheng Ho Pak. Welcome to Copeland's Corner. Hi, Brian. How are you? I am great. Happy holidays. It's good to have you. So tell me, what are folks going to see on December 17th? If they, you, if they... I just can't wait. It is going to be the biggest holiday experience you'll ever imagine. I mean, we call it a holiday spectacular, Brian, because it, it's got to be a spectacle, right? Yes, and it's got to be. <laughs> it's it's, 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 it's got to be. It's it better. Uh, truth in advertising. We've got so many performers on stage. We've got two fantastic singers. One of them is a beautiful soprano named Erica Gabriel, who sings everything from opera to gospel to jazz. I mean, she's just one of the most energetic and gorgeous voices. I mean, truly worth the price of admission. And then another wonderful soprano. Her name is Deanna Loveland from Nashville. Mm-hmm. And, and she pl- sings, she plays piano, and she plays harp as well. And she's got this real kind of Nashville pop sound. It's just really gorgeous. And they're going to sing a lot of songs separately, but they're going to sing a big finale, Oh Holy Night, together. Oh, I love Oh Holy Night. I know. It's one of my yet, favorite carols. It's not, it's not Christmas unless you have Oh Holy Night. And then we've got two dance companies, Brian. One is the Yoko's Academy of, the, of Dance and the Performing Arts they perform to us every year and they always do a bit of Nutcracker. So if people feel like, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to see the whole Nutcracker, you get to see the highlight, the end of Act One, Snowflakes. Uh, oh, I love that. The whole chorus. And and to sing behind the Snowflakes, they're going to, we're going to have the San Francisco Girls Chorus. Do you know them by any chance? Yes, I've seen them perform once. They are, they are world class. They perform with some of the biggest um, opera companies and performing uh, orchestras. Phenomenal organization they're going to be singing a beautiful a cappella version of silent night and carol the bells i mean they're just phenomenal so they're going to be joining us two dance companies chorus two and then behind all of this the fabulous bay philharmonic the bay philharmonic is one of the most energetic most theatrical what do i mean by theatrical brian we've got a huge screen on the back that we project images of, of christmas and holidays for all of our shows um, we use it as a kind of a backdrop. And then we've got two giant monitor screens on either side. And so it, it's a really multi-sensory event. So it's a whole multimedia presentation. You totally. Go you know, we've got to, Brian. We're in, the, we're in an age of Netflix. We're in the age of podcasts. Mm-hmm. If you're not really entertaining and energetic, uh, immersive and all this other good stuff, then you're behind the times. Let me ask you this. You talk about us being in the in the age of Netflix. So yes. I mean, dealing with Netflix and podcasts and streaming yes. and internet and everything else, yes. it is more difficult to get live bodies to come out and put and yes. put behinds in in seats. Now, on top of that, we're still dealing with in, in the performing arts. We're still dealing with the aftermath of the COVID shutdown. Mm-hmm. So, so tell me what has built has 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 Bay Philharmonic done uh, in order to to get audiences out? Because when I understand, you guys are doing great. Boy, you have hit the nail on the head in terms of that question. What are the live performing arts? Whether you're Broadway, whether you're uh, a theater company, even if you're a museum, which is kind of like a live performance because you got to go to a museum, mm-hmm. or it, and maybe even someday sporting events may be affected as well because there will be a day in immersive reality that you'll be able to be on the football field, maybe in the huddle, and you won't have to go and sit, you know, a hundred yards away up in the nosebleed section. I think, Brian, the, the, the way out of this is to be more human. How do you mean? What do you mean by more human? AI will become so real 
AI will become so indistinguishable. The, the, the image that you see right now, where they'll scan my face in, they'll scan my voice in, mm -hmm. it'll be really scary like this. But the more emotional, the more passionate, the more unpredictable, uh, the more human we can be, then we will outpace the machines. And so that is my goal, Brian, is to present as much passion. Now, you haven't seen me conduct. But no, when I, I have not. In front, of, in front of the orchestra, I use my body and I use my face and I use my hands. I am one of the most energetic conductors out there because I'm giving a show to the audience as well as to my colleagues in front. I want my colleagues to have a great time. I want them to smile and I want them to play with their heart. So that is really the, the secret sauce. The Bay Philharmonic is not only, the, I think, the most theatrical orchestra around, but I think we have a mission to really be the answer for our humanity. Now you have have conducted orchestras pretty much all around the world, everywhere okay. from you know I, there are so many countries reading your bio that I oh, can't even keep up with them. And countries and cities are there, not to mention Disney that you worked yes. with Disney that you worked with yes. Disney as as well. And yes. from what I understand, I, I've known musicians who have been part of orchestras, and they've always got gripes. Yes, <laughs> they've yes. always got complaints and they've always got gripes. And, and a lot of those gripes are directed at the conductor. And, and from what I understand about the, the musicians who are in your orchestras, they're happy. They're, they're, they're happy. They're in a good mood. They're excited to be there. So tell me, what do you do differently that, that other conductors don't do that end up with disgruntled musicians? Well, I, I don't want to presume that I can read their minds and that I, that I know what they're thinking, but I can tell you what I try to do, Brian, which is, you know, inside all of us, there's a 16-year-old child who is optimistic and maybe got into music because you believe that, that you could change the world. My job, aside from moving my hands and giving them the tempo of the piece and the, and the mood of the piece... My job is to make them believe that they're 16 again. So that means I address them as colleagues. We in rehearsal, we 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 talk together, we work things out. I never order anything from them. I never shout at them like a like an old-fashioned maestro. Mm -hmm. And I, I also um we, we do something unusual, Brian. You know how sometimes you go to an orchestra concert and the conductor comes out and then they bow, but the rest of the orchestra is standing there. Yeah. It, it, as if they're they they're not there. We always bow together. We bow together as a family. That tells you that my my attitude that I am not the star, but we are the stars, and we're thanking the audience together. Another thing I do is I never have anyone call me maestro. Never. I hate that word because maestro means either a teacher or a master, and mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a student of life. I'm learning things all the time. I'm I. If you don't have humility, then you're not going to get very far in this world. So. Those are just some of the reasons why I think the musicians probably enjoy our orchestra. Um, I don't want to say more than others, but a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, if you want to come out and see a fantastic orchestra and a, a fantastic spectacular for the holiday season, come go. on out on December 17th. Again, if you're here in the Bay Area, it is at the Chabot College Performing Arts Center uh, in Hayward, California. If you want tickets, go to Bay Phil, B A Y P H I L dot org. December 17th, Bay Ooh. Philharmonics, a holiday spectacular. Three PM. Hope out. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with us. It's a pleasure. Come back and see us again. My honor. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. This is the part of the podcast that we call Headliners on the Headlines. Our panel of comics this week, Carlos Alosraki joins us from Southern California. Uh, Ron Vi. Ron, I never know where you are. Are you, where, are you in Vegas? Are you home in Vegas? Vegas, yes. Okay, and uh, and Justin uh, Justin Longwood is here with us. Is, uh, Lockwood, forget what I'm saying, Longwood. Justin Lockwood is here with us as well. Where are you? I'm in Benicia. In, Bene in beautiful Benicia. Uh, I'm in the most mundane of all of the locations <laughs> today. In beautiful Benicia. I like Benicia. Benicia's next to the water. You know, it's it's reasonable house prices in the Bay Area, like mm -hmm. one of the few places where you can reasonably buy a home. Benicia's nice. Yeah. I wouldn't live there, but Venetia's nice. It's a nice, <laughs> it's a nice place. <laughs> All right, let's let's start with this. Actually, some some sad news in the world of comedy. Uh, yesterday on Tuesday, uh, Norman Lear, 
the great Norman Lear, passed away at the age of 101. Wow. Uh, I read his autobiography and was was uh, just reading his bio. Um, I'm very fortunate that I, um, I got to be in his presence a handful of times. Uh, he was a major influence on my childhood. You know, we I grew up. You know, the one time my whole family would get together and watch TV, we would watch All in the Family on Saturday nights. We would watch Maud on Monday nights. We would watch One Day at a Time. We would, on Tuesdays, we watch Good Times. We watched all, all of his stuff, a major influence on my work. And when I was doing my first uh, solo play, Not a Genuine Black Man, I watched um, All in the Family, the first two seasons to get the rhythms down between going between comedy and tragedy and going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so he actually came out and saw me. When I when I did that show in Los Angeles, he came out and saw me and said, I like what you're doing. And I said, but I'm ripping you off. And I go, I'm totally ripping you off. And he goes, well, you got me. So um, it's just um, it's 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 a big loss. And and I, I feel like I've lost someone I grew up with. Um, uh, Carlos, you and I are close to the same age. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about the youngsters here. I'm interested to to hear how it uh, it affects Ron and 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 Justin. Obviously, older than we are. I'm 61, and yeah, very instrumental in my black and white TV days on the Sylvania with the UHF and the clicker. And um, and and as far out, I talked to a woman today working in the gym who's in her 90s and worked with him from for 10 years and said, you know, Fernwood Tonight, America Tonight, mm -hmm. even going beyond. But all in the family, instrumental. You know, one of the last probably American shows that d dared to look at sadness and bleakness in Queens and people that weren't handsome, like friends, you know, they had mo modest means, they were getting pie. Mm -hmm. um, so very instrumental in my childhood and what shaped my view of the world. Cause I kind of felt similar. You, you speak about Benicia. I grew up in Concord, California, blue collar right next to Crockett. My dad worked at the CNH factory, which is still there. He was a chemical engineer, quit that, became a li librarian. My mom quit, work to become a seminarian and go into the Episcopal church. So we washed our dishwasher broke. We washed dishes in the garage. And so all that related to us sitting down and watching all in the family and kind of feeling like that was kind of us. We didn't mm -hmm. have these super means. I had a paper route. I was a, you know, I did dish. I was a dishwasher later on. And so that Norman Lear's comedy and th those shows really struck a chord with me growing up in blue collar yeah. Concord, California in the 60s and 70s. I was the son of a single mother who was a legal secretary and, yeah. and a grandmother who worked at a cleaner's. And so, you know, watching watching them get, just get by on good times, we we totally got it and totally understood it. And in terms yeah. of political stuff, I learned what abortion was mm -hmm. when Maud got an abortion in the yeah. 70s. Maud got an abortion. I learned what rape was when Edith got raped or almost got raped, that they, they, they did that on, on at the Sunshine Home. But you also learned within that that rape was not about sexuality. It was about no. power, because obviously G Edith, June, June Stapleton, Jean Stapleton, Stapleton was not somebody that was, you know, this was it was a, it, it educated you on the Vietnam War, about race, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about everything. It was just a wonderful show. Uh, we're coming. It holds up. Real. You didn't if have you to watch it today. It. The issues are the same, except you know, substitute Trump for Nixon, mm -hmm. and, and 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 you know, the a lot of the issues in in, in, in income inequality, all the stuff. It's 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 all the same. Let me ask the other guys because you guys are younger than 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 we are. As I said, we grew up watching this stuff as kids. Uh, have you any familiarity with 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 the, this body of work we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I was born in '79. And I was raised in front of a TV in, in, in the 80s and the 90s. And so at that time, a lot of the stuff from the 70s, particularly uh, All in the Family, The Jeffersons, uh, Maude, um, even One Day at a Time, uh, these were things that I were, was familiar with. And I actually do think, whether I realized it or not, that it actually you know helped me you know sort of develop uh, in many ways. One, as like a comedian, and two, as a human. Uh, because especially with all in the family and the Jeffersons, I grew up in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. So these very much portrayed the sort of families and people that I that I was around. Yeah. And I will say this to like this day, because I remember one of my first dates that I took home to meet my family at Christmas time in like 2001. They were like, your family seems a little racist. <laughs> <laughs> like they are not racist. They will take in everybody. But it's this East Coast attitude that reminded me back of like all in the family and the Jeffersons and things like that. And so, you know, yeah, kind of actually had to have a little discussion with the family to be like, uh, this is how people portray you. And I know this isn't the truth, you know. 
Um, but yeah, all of these issues. I mean, I've got, by the way, I've got beat Arthur on my hat right over oh, here. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> was, was that a Golden Girls hat? Yes, yes, because I forgot that we were on camera and I was not. No, it's fine. Me. It's fine. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I definitely know, I'm familiar with at least a good portion of Norman Lear's work. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and at 101, I mean, what a career. What a career that we should be like, you know, celebrating and looking back and, and looking at these shows and thinking how we can move this into the future because the shows are not what they once were on TV. And 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 he worked till till the bitter end. Uh, last time I saw him was about three years ago. No, it had to be longer now. It was right, it was right before the shutdown. Uh, Rita Moreno was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I got invited to Rita's birthday party and Norman was there. She was doing one day at a time because he brought one day at a time back with a Latino cast. They did a reboot of it. Mm -hmm. and uh, and Rita was part of that cast. So the entire cast w was there at, at her home and and Norman was there and he still, you know, and then he was, I don't know, 97, 98 and going to work every day producing this show. You know, still, I mean, imagine, um, you know, yeah, well, it's like show this. It's like people talking about retiring, you know, retire from what? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, retire from what? I'm going to talk for yeah. free. Retire you know, from Ron what? and I... Ron and I are the same age. And I was I was just listening and thinking to myself that one of the differences that Ron and I had in our childhood that is really different today is that I grew up in an era where the only comedy specials were like late night HBO or you if you stayed up late, you got to watch the you know Johnny Carson and they were all adults. So I grew up, my big influence growing up was, Billy Crystal and, mm -hmm. and 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 just comedians that were in their late thirties and their in their forties. But if you're a comedian today, and you're 19, you can actually find a lot of 19 year old comedians. You can find your peers yeah. in this way that I don't think was available to to Ron and I. So I grew up watching kind of my parents' generation of comedy. So the way that like I got that influence of Norman Lear was that it raised my parents and it raised the comedians that I ended up watching, I think that I ended up growing up on. You bring up a point that relates to television because as, when we were kids, it was Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, Little mm -hmm. Rascals were kids, but Three Stooges, right. all of our earliest comedic influences on television were adults. Whereas yep. my 12 year old and nine year old daughter can go to bunked and could go to, you know, live in Maddie and all that. They, 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 the comedy to them was funneled by kids, two kids. We didn't have that really. Outside of the Little Rascals, all our earliest comedy on camera references were, like I said, we'd go to Shakey's Pizza and there'd be Laurel and Hardy and Abbott mm -hmm. and Costello. It was all adult. So all the stuff that was syndicated. That, that crossed over for your television, you know, or, or you referencing yeah. other comedians. But I will say, yes. Justin, so you, you have a point about, about starting out. Because when I started out, I was 18. And, you know, it was the same thing. I grew up watching, you know, basically my parents' generation of of, of, of comics. You know, watching, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Norman Lear shows. These were all adults. There were no kids on any of these shows. One mm -hmm. day at a time had a couple of teenagers, a couple of actresses playing teenagers. I don't mm -hmm. even know if Valerie Bertinelli was a teenager then or not. But, but you know, playing teenager. But it was still, you know, it was still their generation. And, and it was like the first comic I ever saw who was close to my age when I was starting out at 18, 19 years old was Eddie Murphy. Cause Eddie yeah. Murphy was, was Eddie Murphy was 19, but everybody else, you know, I mean, first stand up I ever saw that was like adult <laughs> stand up, you know, that wasn't, you know, mother-in-law jokes or, you know, you know, a lot of these people we used to see and David Branner would be on TV yeah. all the time. And, and, you know, and folks like this, um, it, it was Richard Pryor, but Richard Pryor was still not, you know, Richard Pryor was 20 years older than I was, you know, at, at that point. But that was the first like grown up comedy I felt like I ever saw. You know, yeah. the reason I became a comic was that 1979 special. If you if you guys have not seen it, you got to see it. Greatest hour and a half of comedy ever filmed is considered. Yeah. yeah, I would sit in awe in front of the TV too and watch things like Bob Hope specials. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff yeah. Like that that we don't have now. And I think that's why as a kid, they never knew what to do with me because I never wanted to hang out with other kids because I was either raised <laughs> on the TV watching all this adult material. And then I wanted to hang out with the adults. Every Saturday night, I'd go over to my 70 year old Aunt Dolly's house and play cards with all the adults. <laughs> <laughs> no use for children. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, one of the things that Norman Lear should get credit for or does get credit for is he made television grow up. Because I, I was I was reading about what, you know what the competition for All in the Family was? It's first season. You know what show it was up against? It was Saturday night. What show it was up against? And this tells you again how TV shifted. And this is 1971, I guess. The show he was up against, uh, he was on CBS and All in the Family was up against Bewitched on wow. ABC. Now think about the difference between those two shows. Was that the Dick York or the Dick Sargent version? It was the Dick Sargent one. It was yeah, the so a little second. bit softer. No chemistry because obviously Dick Sargent was gay. So, but, well, uh, so yeah, it was Dick Sargent. Sorg- but there was but there was plenty of chemistry. But yeah, no, the Dick York version is yeah. But yeah, something light and trite and fun and easy, right? I'm married to a witch. Things are goofy. I got this crazy aunt next door and a gossiper and crazy things happen and mm-hmm. do- dogs can talk or whatever. Versus. Vietnam War, racism, exactly. sexism, you know. Because you look the at the movement. 60 shows, you look at yeah. all those 60 shows, except for like maybe the Smothers Brothers. You look yeah. at those 60 shows today and you go, how did, the, you know, it was it was genies, witches, talking horses. Beverly Hillbillies. I, talk, Beverly Hillbillies. Green Acres. Talking cars. It was all Mr. that. Mr. Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I it was like that. Patrick Haney. It was like that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, and how Munsters, they did Gom- Adam's Monsters, family. Adam's family, and how uh, they did monkeys. Gomer, how they did Gomer Pyle, which took place in the Marine Corps yeah, during Frank Vietnam Sutton. and never mentioned Vietnam. No, you know, he's Frank in Sutton. the Marine Corps. Yeah. Frank Sutton, a great dramatic actor in the movie Marty. But yeah, th- th- it was up against comedies that were light and wanted us to continue that feeling of uh, everything is safe. Everything is wonderful. Everything is easy. Um, you know, and then, yeah, later on, here comes Norman Lear to say, yeah, there's some there's some comedy in, in real pain. Mm-hmm. And thank goodness for that, you know, kind of changed it for us. I read a couple articles recently since the strike that television now, especially looking at streaming, is too dark. Hmm. The TV, it's, it's too cutting, it's too biting, it's too dark. And that, that, People who are creating television need to remember that folks want to be entertained and not everything has to be Breaking Bad and not everything has to be Ozark mm-hmm. or or some of these shows. I, do you think that there's validity to that? Do you think it's too dark? I mean, network TV is network TV, but m- most people aren't watching network TV. I think that's, that's the same kind of complaint that people had in the 70s coming out of like dog day afternoon being like that didn't have dogs in it at all like just complaining <laughs> about whatever kind of great art is going on at the time i mean i i i don't know i mean i i have the opposite response of not to sound like an an old man but ron and i had very similar childhoods and one of the things that we just don't have anymore is i don't feel like we have adult space on late night tv or or much of anywhere you, How do you, you know, define adult late, space. Define adult I mean space. That, I mean that Carson used to have poets and authors and real people on his show, mm-hmm. and now it's a collection of TikTok videos. And yeah, yeah, I I I was the same kind of child as Ron, kind of like hanging out with adults, wanting to be like, mm-hmm. did you see Joan Didion on late night last night? <laughs> and just like mm-hmm. having some sort of sense of adult space and maturity that I don't see on television at all anymore, except for maybe outside of every once in a while, we get something like Breaking Bad that actually does want to plumb the depths of some kind of human experience. But I love how you talk about the adult space. And then I I immediately think to old Carson shows or even the Madge game where like they're all sitting there smoking and drinking. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I miss that. There's no alcohol anymore. There's no sex anymore. There's no drinking anymore. There's it's like there's no, I I it, it it's weird, but those things I don't know do kind of hold what I think of as some kind of adult energy, some sort of adult space. Playboy and to me, dark. the idea of things being sanitized and clean and being childlike are very similar. Well, also too, and, and this is something that I, I have fought with my entire career in in, in television, working you know as as a talk show host on on you know I posted a late night show, I posted a morning show, I posted an afternoon show, and it's always the same thing. You can't do anything that what today some of the stuff like you mentioned, like Carson did with Joan Didion, or having Gore Vidal 
you know, yeah, on exactly. to talk or Truman Capote or an author on or somebody to talk. Um, he, I, I had to pull teeth anytime I wanted to have somebody like that on. And no matter how famous they were, I had to pull teeth. And even then they would give me three minutes or two and a half minutes because right. it's boring. Got to keep it going. Got to keep going. It's got to be going faster. And they would blame MTV for it. They'd say yeah. it's because MTV made everything. It's got to be quick cuts and got to be fast. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson has managed to m m put himself in though. Here's a guy that's a, a physicist, right? And who, who's made himself an entertainer and he has been on the late night talk shows. So he's somebody that, that does break that mold. That is interesting. That is worldly. Um, Elon Musk for as controversial and as wacky as he is another character that, right? He's a, mm -hmm. a bon vivant, not an inventor, a guy that invent, in, invested in things and has become quite successful. So uh, Anderson Cooper will be guest on late night talk shows. So yeah, th it does. There are, there are pockets of it, but uh, yeah, I agree. You know, where's the Dean Martin with a cocktail and a cigarette going, let me tell you about the real Vegas baby. You know, <laughs> like, there was something wonderful about that. There was something kind of real and gritty and the, 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 there is a grittiness. I think that's missing. You know I mean, what I go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say one thing that like sort of what we have now is I like to watch a lot of like UK television and Graham Norton is still yeah. kind of doing that yeah. where people are there that are celebrities, yeah. but you kind of get sort of the human side to them and you get the conversation. And that has always been a dream of mine. And I, I, I don't think it's a very marketable dream, but I've always just talk show with everyday people you don't know them but everyday people are fascinating and they're going yep. through the same struggles i don't need to hear you know about oh here's the person who has eight million hits with their dog playing the flute on tiktok let's talk about like who cares you know uh yeah. so i i wish I, I i'm fascinated by just you know i want the every person's story yeah, I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, a similar idea where you just take somebody on the from San Francisco to to uh, L.A. on the I five, and it's yeah. like Jerry Seinfeld's show, except you get to find yeah. out they're they're literally like you said, they are real people with fascinating stories. And my mm -hmm. I see my mom twice a week on a memory floor. There's a guy that's a World War II vet, 101 years old. There's the second wife of Harry Belafonte in that same building. Wow. There are all kinds of stories there, some with the, their memories gone. What do they remember? Where did they live? Where did they grow up? What country are they from? So you're right, there is a, there's a plethora of stories just waiting to be told to, to somehow make that palatable for us would be, I think it would be a, a wonderful thing, but I, I'll, I'm, I'll plug I'm on something. board with you, Ron. I'll, I'll plug something just really quick that people can find on Instagram and a couple other places that, that kind of gets into that and it's called, um, it's called Hot Takes on the Subway. And it is just this wow. guy in New York going to random people and say, just tell me something that you're passionate about. I and they're it. one minute sure. each. And some of those stories are amazing and wonderful. Oh, that's great. Hot Takes. Hot, uh, takes, on collect, hot takes on the Subway. Okay, I'll check it out. I, I collect old radio and I've been a fan of, of old, you know, the golden age of radio, you know, 40s primarily for, for years. And Fred Allen, who was one of the biggest comedians in in, in early broadcasting, uh, he's the one who said that television is called a medium because nothing is ever really well done. Oh, that was that was the Fred Allen one. And that and my, my favorite is that a celebrity, a celebrity is someone who works hard all his life to become famous, only to wear dark glasses and hope not to be recognized. Yeah, uh, that's how brilliant and witty he was. He used to have a segment on his show called People You Never Expected to Meet. And he would bring on like the mailman. And he would bring on like the cab driver who dropped him off that night at the so studio. He's always been there. Yeah. And bring him on for five minutes, just ad lib with him for five minutes. It's almost akin to being a stand up comic, and I don't do that much anymore. I, I always felt there were people that were way more interesting and funnier than I was. I just had the guts to go up there and do it. You know, mm -hmm. I oh, was, sure. I was sure. people that, like a cab driver, like a, a pilot on a plane, like, like the guy at the grocery store, like, dude, you're way funnier than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys do much crowd work? Yeah. Do you do a lot of crowd work? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do. I, I'll tell you why, though. It's not, and I have a rule for it. My rule is that I have to do double the, or triple the jokes for the amount of crowd work that I do. It just can't be a crowd work set. But I had to get really good at it because with the ADD and everything, I just, it, early on, I couldn't remember anything. <laughs> and I would like, <laughs> my choice was to freeze or was to talk to somebody. But I do crowd work differently. I don't know what's your name, where you're from, blah, blah, blah. What do you blah, do blah. for a living? Yeah, yeah, because that slows it down. I keep it moving. I point something out. But the, the way I look at crowd work, and I don't even know where you're going with this, the way I look at it is there's a whole different group of people in the whole world in front of you in that moment. And you do have to acknowledge that. 
Sometimes you don't have the stage time or, or the amount of time to do that. But if it's my own 45 minute show, then I have the whole all the time in the world. And you got to acknowledge that and make it special. Wait, can I yeah, I'm not going question? anywhere with this particular. We were just talking oh. about, you know, <laughs> no, we were just talking about, you know, my friend Alan about talking, you know, just talking to people and ad lib and that's well, and talking is, to regular people. And it is fascinating because, oh my God, I did just do crowd work with somebody and it was such a fascinating story. And of course, I can't remember it right now. And it'll come to me when we finish this but uh but you do find those amazing things and sometimes you find people on opposite ends of the room that have similar stories and similar connections and i think it's super duper fascinating uh the only problem is is that i love making those connections and finding out about people but the problem for a comedy standpoint is keep it moving right yeah, yeah. let me ask you a question ron because i i would I, I, somebody asked me about this um last week so i don't i don't do a lot of crowd work. I wish I was looser on stage, but I'm a writer and I want to go up and kind of do my Me stuff. Too. Me too. And and I I wish I was better at kind of leaping off this way and coming back. I'm not I'm not fantastic at it. Um but somebody was asking me about crowd work because I, I did a show, it was about 100 people. They were on the rowdier side and I did have to break away more just to corral the energy. And I was talking to some comics about it after the show. Ron, have you noticed, because you're in clubs a lot in a lot of different capacities, that if I go on to Instagram or TikTok or any of these things, everyone's posting crowd work. If you were to like land on yeah. this planet mm -hmm. and be like, what is stand-up comedy? You'd open up TikTok and be like, oh, it's all crowd work. Nobody's writing jokes anymore. And so yeah. what do you think, Ron, about the message that that sends to audiences? Because <laughs> I'm seeing this uptick in this like, People talking to me, almost looking to, I don't think they're being jerks about it. I think they're like, this is what this the is condition. now. Let me help you get your bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I I have so many thoughts on this. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to rein them in a little bit. Uh, first of all, the new generation sees stand up. They don't learn it from Carson and television. They learn it from TikTok and social media and it's a minute or less half the time and then they have no attention span to go with longer stuff in the clubs uh i do know firsthand about this crowd work stuff it's forced and that is the problem i am on email chains because of my day job or just through other comics trying to put me in touch with other people where people are like hey i'm coming to the city do you know anybody who can tape in case i get any good crowd work clips like I've wow. seen that wow. multiple times now that people hire local comics and stuff to tape them in each city just to get that social media crowd work clip. And the problem is it, it's to chase, right? And a lot of things come to you when you're not looking for them. So they're forcing this crowd work. And so they're forcing that this is now what stand up is. To me, it's all a balancing act, like any good story, right? When you open up a book and there's the beginning, the middle and the end. And mm -hmm. it's got the different characters, different points. I personally do crowd work. The way, and, and I've never, I've never set out going, "Hey, I'm doing all crowd work today." Hey, I'm doing only material. What, whatever happens, happens for me. I know my act. I know where I start. I know where I end, and I know the possible jokes in the middle. And then I go back and forth. Right? Maybe somebody says something, and there's a good joke that I have stored in my brain, yeah. and so I like to bounce in between. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an A to Z comic. So that's the way that I view um, uh, view crowd work. But I think that the, the chase, because they think this is the in thing, this is the fad. It's a trend, basically, on TikTok. You know, you got the ice bucket challenge. You've got planking. Now you've got crowd work. Like, I feel, I feel like that's mm -hmm. the uh -huh. trend. And, um, and, you know, I'll just throw the name out there. I have no opinions on Matt Rife whatsoever. Matt Rife is a very nice guy. And I am not going to judge his comedy, but I think he's one of the names that have been like focal in bringing up this sort of crowd work trend because during the pandemic, that's what a lot of his clips were. Uh, but apparently he was also pushing his ass off during the pandemic and going and live streaming every day. So you can't fault anybody uh, for anything. But I don't like this crowd work trend where it becomes a thing that you just get up there and talk and see if something happens. Mm -hmm. That's not comedy. Comedy is laughs per minute. It's punchlines. It's I, I also play comedy with a message, by the way, because so many people can't do a message. And I, it's great that people feel compelled or forced. Uh, not compelled. They feel compelled to share what, what they feel, whether it be something simple as like we hate Trump or, or something deeper. But you still have to do that with jokes, too. 
we're getting away yeah. from like what comedy is all about, which is yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> and writing material. Well, I will say, like when Carlos and I were coming, Evan Carlos, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but the 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 the, the rap on you know, while there were some that who did crowd work almost ex like Paula Poundstone, who yeah. did crowd work almost almost ex extent exclusively. She did yes. so much of it, but she was brilliant at it. But yeah. for the most part, people who did crowd work when you and I were coming up were just considered people who were too lazy to write. Yeah, that's how we looked at it. Is that it was people you're too lazy to write a set, so you're gonna walk around the audience and ask everybody what they do for a living, yeah, and hope and they, hope that something's funny. Yeah, because I think the, the person that that tried to breach that uh, coming out of entertaining comedy was uh, into truth was Rick Rick. Rick Reynolds, right? Only Rick Reynolds. Funny. Because yeah. outside of that, I loved Mike Meehan. I loved Jeremy Kramer. Mm -hmm. I loved Me David too. Feldman. I, I loved, um, I, I just loved guys that just did weird stuff that had nothing to do with truth or anything. They're just bizarre. Michael Meehan would just, well, he's an odd looking bird and walk across <laughs> the stage. And it was hilarious. Bob you Rubin. Know? And Bob Rule, the old rooms in town, and reached into the innards of an old mountain yak and found my car keys. Donut figures, always in the last place you look. You know, there were guys, there was Alex Bennett Radio. There was nothing sort of really devoted to truth and bearing your soul. That yeah. came later after Rick Reynolds, I think, kind of punched a hole in it a little bit. Even Warren Thomas was like, the first Negro on first class. Can I get some more peanuts, please? <laughs> you know, they, they were, it was just a wonderful, different, inventive time right there in that late 80s to the early 90s, this pocket of weird inventiveness. And so I really, no, those guys weren't doing crowd work. They were going, let me show you these strange pieces in my brain museum. It was almost, it was like almost them. performance art. It, yeah. it was, it was, it was a lot like what Andy Kaufman used to do. Yeah. You know, that kind of weird stuff. That's, that's the era that I plugged into coming from Sacramento. I was like, oh my God, Stephen Pearl, Mike Meehan, Warren Thomas, you know, yourself and everybody, you know, this is, well, and Booker talk, and D.L. and Moss were a little bit different, you know? When I talk to new comedians, I often say that like comedy is like your resume, right? Like, like if you're going to go to a job interview and sit down um, and they say, you know, tell me about yourself. Like, do you have to pull up notes and be like, oh, I am like, you know, like this is you uh -huh. talk to dive deep. This is your resume, like coming out of you. Like you have, there has to be a sense of preparedness and you have to know what you're talking about. You want to share. Like, I'll just tell you because, you know, I, I, I audition all the comics who work at the punchline and cops now. Right. That is oh, like what cool. I do. My day oh, job. I didn't know you did that. I guess you know I'm going to be nicer to you then. What? <laughs> I guess I'm going to be nicer to you then. Right? I've been doing this for nine years. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's been a minute, hasn't it? Yes. I didn't know you were auditioning people. Okay, I didn't know that was on you. Anybody who's not like a known headliner, I'm the mm. one you have to go through. Now, I hope, sorry, I do hope people are watching your podcast, Brian, but I hope no local comics are watching your podcast. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but you, could, you, could tell, you could tell but those no, people what you're looking for. Yeah, well, and the, well, the whole point is this: is that somebody um, not too long ago um, asked me to watch them, and I'm like, sure, of course. And I watched them, and I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> and he's like, well, why? And I'm like, well, first of all, you did 15 minutes of jokes in a five minute set, but more importantly, mm. you opened with something so fascinating, so fascinating. You were um, you were married and divorced before you were 21, and then you literally did a sentence on that and then abandoned. And then you started talking about transsexuals and all this stuff. I'm like, nobody wants your hot take on the, those items, but everybody has had something like a relationship that has been good, that has been bad. So maybe mm -hmm. they weren't married and divorced by the time they were 21, but they, um, but, but they experienced it and they can relate to that. And this is very fascinating. This makes you you, so you should expand on this. And then they argued with me on all the reasons why I was wrong. And I'm like, but that's the thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's coming back to like who you are and portraying that. And we've gotten to like crowd work and everybody's hot takes. I, 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 I avoid religion and politics as much as possible because I already have to put up a little fight in some of these markets and venues when I go in because they immediately view me as different as soon as they hear my voice or see me like come mm -hmm. on stage. So I have to like show them how we are alike and whether that be talking about my love of football and my dad owning an auto body shop in the eighties and be going mm -hmm. to all these classic car conventions. Like there has to be a, some way that I can bridge the gap. And that's what I try to explain to a lot of the new comics, but all they see is one minute tips on uh, clips on TikTok 
and all the social media and that's what they try to emulate and it just doesn't work out because they're always going for that hot take or the clip and that's what drives me insane mm -hmm. i remember when um phyllis diller died joan rivers was still alive and she was interviewed and she said phyllis diller's first joke and i don't remember that joke which is like often for years our first joke wasn't a great joke it was one sentence set up one sentence punchline and in that joke, it told you everything you need to know about the next 45 minutes and who she was. Yes. I'll ask my manager, Heidi Robart, because she worked with Phyllis at a high school since she was 18 years old. So wow. I'll get the answer for you. And what, yeah, what, yeah, you're is... right. You know who somebody, even if it's, it is a Mitch Hedberg who's not telling the truth or an Arch Barker, their truth mm -hmm. is in their weirdness and weird <laughs> avant-garde punchlines. They're not trying to be somebody that they're not. And you can tell right. that from a performer. You can look at a performer mm -hmm. and go, nope, they're trying too hard. There's yeah, it's an interesting example too because I, I I got to see him pretty close to, to when he when he died uh, unfortunately, but and I had no idea who he was actually at the time. Mm -hmm. I was just dragged. He showed up with a saxophone player and a stand up bass and yes. did like freeform poetry for like forty five minutes, <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it so much. I was a theater kid at the time. I was like, you can do stand up and do this. Like, what is this weird thing that's mm -hmm. going on? I saw um, Rickles the year before he died. Yeah. Rickles. And, and, what, and what he kept to with... what he was. Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again, Ron? I'm sorry. He I saw Rickles the year before he died. And what was fascinating is I'm not sure a lot of people enjoyed it, but he kept true to who he was. He wasn't trying yes. to do modern day jokes. No, he, he didn't. was calling people Polacks and stuff, you know? And, <laughs> But then he and he would integrate songs in there because that's like what his style was and what they did, you know, back then. And that was fascinating to see that he just kept true to who he was, and you couldn't like fault him for that. All uh, crowd so, work, by the way, too. Almost all crowd work, work is what he did. You, you know, know there's, it, it all kind of comes. It all kind of comes down to this thing that I think Ron was kind of hinting at that there is a lot of truth to the more specific. And fewer people you're for, the more, more universal you become. Yeah, yeah, that's it. My, my 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 better version of my comedy came in my latter years after I got married and had kids. I was mm -hmm. always trying to be a Warren Thomas or a Meehan or a Kramer or a Ruben or a Robin. I was always trying to be that because that's what San Francisco was, and mm -hmm. I was good. I could do good do things. I won the competition. I was a good performer, but I was never better than after I became vulnerable as a parent and as a husband and even with age i went okay now i can finally be me and tell some stories and th that's when i hit my stride i thought so see me it was when i started doing solo shows when yeah. i started doing solo plays that that's when it changed for me because for the first i i had spent 20 years before that and i was doing fine i was opening for you know big people and doing all this stuff but i was telling people what i thought mm -hmm. as opposed to who i am Yep. And once I started doing solo work, then I was able to, I didn't have to worry so much about laugh, 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 laugh. I could actually go into some depth about, about some things. Yeah. And um, while it's not, it's not popular to say now, um, I did a lot of work with Cosby. Never saw anything, had nothing to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my, that's my disclaimer. But he, the thing he said about our generation of comics and younger comics is, is that uh, he said like when he was starting and his, his style up till the end is, was to, to take a, a kernel of something and then extrapolate it, go as deep into it as you possibly can, where he says, what we do is we get in and out. Mm -hmm. Because we, we get in and out, we don't go into any depth about anything where you have something like that line you were talking about, about being married and divorced about uh, uh, by being 21. You know, he could have taken that and made an hour out of it. Yeah. You know, and made an hour out of it easily because there, there are so many facets and so many ways. Of, I'm thinking of stuff right now that you could do with that premise. Well, and going back to like somebody like Phyllis Diller, it's simple, but there's a video somewhere on the internet where she's doing 45 minutes of mother in law jokes. Just that one topic, <laughs> 45 minutes, boom, 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 boom. Just exploring every, you know, facet and asset. So yeah, we go in and out. And and to me, I actually don't, and of course, because I watch comics that are newer, right? Host features and so forth. I'm watching people usually five years or less, maybe 10 years or less. So you see a lot of that, right? Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And you kind of get whiplash you kind of get mm -hmm. oh new premise new premise new premise new premise and it's like whoa it's like it, it, you know it's too much and the same thing though I, I it's always easier to see other people's acts than it is your own so like you know yeah i i, I find like i have the same trouble too sometimes like making that like that that arc and and, and trying to get in there but 
it, it, it's it's very fascinating how stand-up is changing. And I will say this too. Um, when I first started my job, uh, I auditioned a comic and, um, you know, my boss, who's been the head booker at, at, at those clubs for a long time, she never likes her name mentioned, but we all know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. she turned I know, I know to... when she was a waitress. That's how far yeah. back. Hang on. Car yeah, Carlos said I knew her when she was a waitress. You'll have I mean, to tell me off screen. Been, yeah. She's been around forever now. She's got the big title and she loves it because nobody locally knows who she is because they all come and bother me. Uh, <laughs> but um, she, I, uh, one of the first people I auditioned uh, in the mid-2015, 2016 or so, she said, are you going to pass them? And I go, yeah. She goes, they have nothing to talk about right now. They're so young and green, but you could tell that they're going to be good. And then guess what? That person is headlining all over right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, like all across the country and out of the country. So, so, you, 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 so yeah, in the beginning, you don't have crap to talk about. And we, we do like sort of, so we have to look at these things to see what comedy is all about and say, oh, there's set up punch, there's storytelling, there's different styles, but then we have to step away. I think we're chasing too much of what we see on TikTok, like mm -hmm. the crowd work and stuff like that. I will mm -hmm. tell you that that was one, one of the disadvantages that I had. It's, I started I started stand up two weeks after I graduated from high school. Mm. That's when I started. I was 18 years old when I started. And at 18 years old, you think you know everything and you don't right. know jack shit. And and I right. had no, I had life experience, but I didn't have life experience. You know what I mean? Not enough life experience to have anything interesting to talk about or to, to know how to, to talk about it in a way that it was interesting and revealing and funny at the same time. So starting that young, I was lucky enough to be able to have the time to learn the craft, to learn here's how you craft a joke. Here's how you craft a setup, uh, how you craft a punchline. Here's how you deal with an audience and you control an audience and you keep an audience as focused to the stage. But in terms of actually having life experience, when you're 18, 19 years old, you really don't have a whole hell of a lot to say. I mean, you really, you yeah. really don't. And so, you know, when I look at comics who are that young, I admire their guts in terms of at 18 years old, getting up to do that. But it's like, you know, you, and you can tell, you can look at someone going, yeah, once you get a little life experience under your belt, once you get married and have a couple of kids, once you write, <laughs> a, couple, once you write a couple of alimony checks, <laughs> you know, then, then you'll have something to say. They don't have a lot a lot to say, but I'm not going to be a, a what's his name, Vivak Vistak Ravaswarmi and say that they can't vote. Did These people that don't have a lot to say might decide our next president, this yes. Gen Z people. So I don't care comedically if you don't know yourself, just know you have to vote blue. That's all, that's all you got to do, <laughs> kid. Go and vote blue, well, get it done. Go, go, go. Thank you for the segue, because I spent three hours prepping a show that we got nowhere near. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> we got no comedy. It's what else the comedy can get. We started talking about comedy at the craft. And well, I did po again. political so, radio this morning, so it was just seeping. It was just sitting there like yeah. an old coffee filter. Well, let me let me tell you. Thank you, thank you for the segue. Let me let me throw a couple of topical things in here. Um, I've been watching Liz Cheney give interviews all week. You know, because her new book is out, and she is taking no prisoners. She's talking about everything that that, that uh, has gone on in the GOP, uh, in the House, in the Republican conference, everything that happened uh, before, during, and around January 6th, and, and just some of the stuff. Kevin McCarthy, former speaker who was kicked out, has announced today that he is not going to run for re-election, that he's out after the end of next year. And what? And I think the final straw was what she wrote in her book about him, that when remember, during January 6th, he came out and said that Trump was responsible for this yep. and he you know just he need to be held accountable and then he goes to mar-a-lago two days later and takes a picture with him and comes back and it's all changed and she said kevin mar-a-lago what the hell and he said well i heard that trump wasn't eating i heard that he was depressed and wasn't People. eating so i went to see him and so that was kind of like the last straw. when is trump ever not eaten let's look at the man for god's sake when is trump ever not eaten Wait, what? McDonald's was closed. What do you mean, to Trump? Trump's not eating. But anyway, she says she says that that um, that the Republicans. This is Liz Cheney, Republican royalty, who I agree with about absolutely nothing, and she's just as conservative and anti-abortion and anti-choice and everything else she ever was, ever was before. She says that the GOP cannot be in the majority in 2025 because if they are, we're in serious trouble. And she says that a vote for Trump is a vote against democracy. And she says basically she hasn't actually come out and said it, but she has. As they said, would you vote for Biden? And she said, I'll do whatever I have to do. Yeah. 
you know, so she's saying that, you know, I mean, so I guess the question to ask is she lost her seat because of the things she said. She lost her seat in Congress. Rep again, Republican royalty. Her father was, you know, vice president, architect. Some people, you know, the, the epitome of evil for a couple of years. In other and, words, she and, was canceled. <laughs> basically, yes. Mm -hmm. Canceled by that. So, so she actually came out for the Constitution and she lost her seat. Is it fair to say that she is a hero? Is it fair to say, or is that hyperbolic, to say that she is a profile in courage? Because she knew what was going to happen. She was she was from a state, Wyoming, where Trump won something like 80% of the vote. And she knew what was going to happen. Hmm. I mean, I'm not willing to go that far, no. But... <laughs> No, you know, I mean, look, and I'm, I'm, it's admirable. I'm glad that you did it. Good for you. But it, it's for me, this is one of these things. It's like we, we throw around the word genius and hero now with a lot of abandon and um, the bar's a lot lower. Admirable. I'm glad she's doing it. Good for her hero. No, <laughs> no, not doing that one. <laughs> I think I did it before on your show, but I always go back to the Chris Rock bit about regarding parenting. Well, I'm a parent to my, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You don't get credit for things that you're supposed to do. So I'm I'm in lockstep there with with Justin. No hero, no courageous. Yes, because that it, uh, given the parameters and and the people she's working with, it does take courage to do something ordinary. Unfortunately, yeah. And she did sacrifice. Look, she gave something up. You put yep. something on the line. Even if I don't agree with you, and even if I don't appreciate the outcome, if you're really actually willing to give something up in your life that she clearly loved doing clearly she loved being a politician it's hard to get elected you know mm -hmm. so if if you're willing to give anything up it, it almost doesn't matter to me what it is and it really doesn't matter to me what you're talking about i at least have respect for the fact that you're willing to do that and if you look at stuff i mean if, if you ever get a chance if you've never seen the movie dick see it um where, where christian bale plays plays her father and it goes up to her right. Vice. Dick is a different movie. The movie's called Vice. No, it's called Dick. No, it's not. <laughs> I'm almost positive. Dick is a different movie oh, about boy. Nixon. No, there's there there is one about Nixon too, and about Watergate. That's a that's a spoof. But this one's called Dick too. I'm I'm almost look it up, somebody. I'm almost positive. Okay, okay. Dick versus Vice. <laughs> the Dick Vice, whole different thing. <laughs> it's a completely different thing. <laughs> but but it goes up to her running for uh, for that congressional seat. Well, let me say. Is it vice? It's vice, my man. I saw I'm it wrong. Vice. I'm wrong. I will I, I stand corrected. Is it's that, a good move. Dick, Dick is the Nixon the Nixon Watergate spoof that they did 15 yeah, years ago with, or something. Uh, yeah, Christian. I mean I watched I something called corrected. Dick completely different. Yeah. <laughs> so and you that, wish it starred Christian Bale. I mean yeah. Ron would leave his job. Santa Fe. Male dick movie. <laughs> and that was my complete digression. That was my very first audition for a television talk show job. I was for a late night show for, for PBS in, in San Francisco. And what they, they had me come in and they said, okay, we're going to show you a short film. And then you're going to enter, then you're going to spend five minutes interviewing the, the, the creator of this film. And the movie was called Dick. And that's all I saw. You know, they, they put it up on on the on, on video, Dick. And then it was just shot after shot after shot of penises. That mm -hmm. was it for five minutes. Just shot after shot after shot after shot after shot after shot of penises. And then it's okay. Now talk to the filmmaker. Oh wow. And I don't remember what the hell I said. I don't remember. I I got the job, but I have no idea because it was just so kind of taken aback. I was not expecting. I was not expected this, but just that that was the first film called Dick I'd ever I, wow. I ever saw. There you go. I don't think the film went anywhere. I, I haven't <laughs> seen anywhere since. I don't I don't think they, they it opened over the Christmas holiday season. Uh, yeah, I could be completely the totally 12 wrong. days of Dick. <laughs> <laughs> so so they are saying that that this the the there are several people who are saying Democratic and Republican that that if Trump wins, this could be the last election. Again, I'll go back to the word hyperbol hyperbolic. Is is this is this really an existential crisis, in your opinion, or is this overblown? Is is this is this chicken little yelling crisis, that the sky's falling? It's an existential crisis, but I always uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure there there might not be agreement with me here on the on the panel, but I I continue to push back on our focus on Trump as a figurehead, whether Trump wins or not. Everyone that voted for him remains. We are focused 
way too much on the symptoms and not enough on the root cause. Um, and we don't address it as Democrats either. We have a complete moral failing when it comes to our obsession with this buffoon and instead um, spend none of our energy, our time, our intellect, our compassion on addressing everyone else who is so angry and so disillusioned and so upset that they're willing to elect a person like this. And until we stop focusing on this man and start focusing on the real issue, this is just going to come up again. This isn't going anywhere. But here's where this is where I jump in. And I always jump in on Stephanie Miller. This, we're at the point of the movie of the night of the living dead where the zombies are breaking into the house. And so to address the cause, we don't have time for that. We got to board up the windows and kill the zombies. That's what we got to do. So it's a pragmatic choice. It's a, it's a binary system. What we want, what we dream about is not going to happen. It never will. All these other things give us the illusion of agency. We don't have agency. All we can do is vote. And I'm sorry to say that be, that's reality. I'm going to be Gary Marshall in, def, in defending your life or living uh, lost in America. We're the casino. We don't give back the money. There is no Santa Claus. So while this seems wonderful that we could address the cause, we can't do that in 2024. It's all hands on deck for Biden to stop what is ultimately more evil. Then we'll go from there because we do need to stop Trump because he's demonstrated what he's been able to do without power outside of the White House. So, yeah, I don't think it's hyperbolic. All hands on deck. Vote for who you don't want to vote for. But this uh, idea, this notion that we're going to look at the cures of our country and solve it in 2024, not going to happen. Not going to happen. We don't have agency. All these tours that these people do, these, I, I, Brian knows me, the Jimmy Doors, the Graham Elwoods, that come to my tour and I'll change the, you're not going to change the world. You're, you're the guys in the park with the beekeeper hit suits and the plastic swords saying, I'll teach you self-defense. It doesn't work. <laughs> it just gives you the illusion analysis. that you have power. I'm sorry, we don't have power. We have two choices. Trump, who's a fucking asshole and a dick and, and, and evil, or Biden, who's not perfect. It's pretty easy. Kill the zombies. We'll address the root cause of what caused the infection that made people sick later. But right now, we got to kill the zombies or, or we're all dead. Does that sum it up? <laughs> I mean, that's I can't disagree with it. I mean, that's that's the way that I look at it as well. I feel sorry for young people who think they can make a difference. Yay, yay, yay. And we're like, I got kids. I got fucking bills. You're not there yet, man. You will be there. We are the old guys on the lawn, but I'm fucking telling you the truth. We got to kill the fucking zombies. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I don't out. agree, but I appreciate your succinctness. I don't I know. What, <laughs> this is what uh, see that. But that seems flippant. What don't you agree on? No, it's it's it's, it's not flippant. It's it's genuine. But what do you do? Do you disagree that we should not vote for Biden? Then? Oh, um, I mean, this is, again, this is going to get one of the things I, I haven't voted for the Democratic Party in 20 years. So you're essentially then you're not in a state where it does happen. But that's a vote for Trump. That's a factual number. This is people when I blame the Democrats who didn't vote for for Al Gore. And I also blame the third party people that voted for Ralph Nader. You enabled Bush, which enabled Citizens United, which enabled a worse Supreme Court, third party voting or protesting voting. There's no evidence to suggest that it has moved the needle anywhere politically. 20 years, 23 years ago, we've given it 23 years to move the needle. It hasn't. It's made it worse. Again, you're young. I get it. There's this notion that there's ideology when you can change the world. Reality doesn't work that way. Money's against you. I'm sorry. I, and people, because people will attack me. You're, there, to me, there's no greater white privilege than to pretend that your vote doesn't have a consequence. And if you vert, vote third party in states electorally, where the electoral college is going to decide it, that's a vote for Trump. That's a fact. It's standing up in a lifeboat to say there's a better, you're going to tip the whole lifeboat over based on principles that you're never going to get to get to. It's a toehold on a mountain climb that you can't reach. You're going to reach for it. We're all going to slip and fall. And I, it sounds like doomsday. But again, is there any, any evidence to suggest that voting for Ralph Nader in 20, 2000 helped this country go farther left? There's none. It made it worse. It made it worse. This is what we're screaming and trying to say. 
I, I get it. It's political tours and Jimmy Doors, and they're all sexy. These these things are sexy, and they sound great. I I can change the world, and like you can't. Look, you said that in 2000. It's 2023, and it's gotten worse. I'll show you. I'll tell you, you something that's scary. I'll tell huh? you something scary. My 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 daughter is an editor for a uh, for a news website that uh, covers stories from the perspective of underrepresented communities, people of color, uh, LGBTQ community, uh, poor people, homeless people, incarcerated people. It covers the news from their perspective. And yeah. they talk to a lot of young people and a lot of Gen Zers. There are a lot of Gen Zers who are represented, a lot of Gen Zers write for this site. Yeah. And what she says that they're hearing and hearing in large numbers now is because of the situation in Gaza, you have a lot of Gen Zers who are saying, screw Biden. It's a I'm not single issue. Biden. Either I'm going to stay home or I'm going to vote for, you know, well, they're not going to vote for, 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 for Kennedy, for Kennedy Jr. But, but basically they'll stay home or, or, or write somebody in. Because they're ignoring the fact that you have two choices. Again, they're pretending that they have a third choice because Trump was completely silent on illegal settlements. Trump uh, changed the capital of uh israel from tel aviv to jerusalem Absolutely. trump was worse than biden you have two choices kids of america that are going to vote you don't have a third choice if you don't vote for biden you are helping trump somebody worse than biden i know you dream of a third choice but again it doesn't exist i'm sorry that it doesn't exist i don't make the rules i'm just telling you factually you you won't be doing anything by not voting for biden but helping trump that is that is a direct. And again, there's no greater white privilege than than to pretend that you're not doing that. You OK, are. now here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, and I will I will tell you this. And maybe, maybe it's our age, but I, I agree with you. But saying what you're saying, don't you feel like you're peeing in the wind? I, I have to. I, mean, I, got kids. Like I have to. I have kids. I have kids. I'm going to I'm desperate. Yeah, I'm peeing in the wind. But I got kids. You don't you don't know what it's like. You're not a parent. You don't, you don't love something right, greater Carlos, than yourself. First of all, I am a parent and I do have kids. Okay. And I'm 45 years old and I appreciate your passion, but you're going on and on and putting words in my mouth and telling me what I'm doing. Okay. Isn't, it, it really isn't, isn't, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to try to turn this into a drama thing. Here's the question but I'll ask you. Brat, Why wouldn't you vote for the best attacking. chance to defeat Donald Trump? That's my question. Why won't you vote for the best chance to defeat Donald Trump and what's logical about that choice. Carlos, at the end of the day, I understand the quote unquote logic of what you're talking about. If you it's want not to quote unquote, it, it is logic. If you want to do it through the prism of we're stuck as rats in a maze with only these two choices. But we the are. fact is that there are, we're not actually though, there are other candidates. And Who can you win? can say that that's well, a throwaway finish, vote. And you can say that it's a throwaway vote, but the idea of voting your conscience isn't something for you to just piss on because it doesn't create the outcome that you don't want. Voting your conscience to me is standing up in a lifeboat. Again, can you name me what has gotten better since voting your conscience for Ralph Nader uh, in 2000? Carlos, what has gotten better with your system? Uh, better the, before Roe versus Wade collapse, we had the ACA, Affordable Care Act, which took a hell of a lot of work. We had, for a time, a decent Supreme Court. We had a student loan forgiveness. ACA We're attempting to get nothing that. nothing but a windfall for corporations that has kept us in a broken system and will continue to keep us in a broken system for decades to come. What candidate? And I'm candidate? not talking about the last election or this. I'm talking about the last 40 years and our slow slide into our current state. But Things that has better. And you're but, confused. Like, it will. It will get better. It will get better. I'm not saying better. no. Yeah, now you're putting words well, in my yeah. mouth. You're putting words in my mouth. I'm not saying it's going to get better. I'm coming back at you with the same energy that you're coming at. Don't dish out what you can't take. I can take it. No, I didn't say it was going to get better. I never said that. I said, this is what we have. I said, I'm not pretending that it's going to get better. Again, there is no candidate that you can tell me that is going to change the behavior of MAGA and the right and Congress. Cornell West, Jill Stein, have they ever passed legislation? 
Can they win? Ele- Do they have the numbers to win the election? This is when I talk about logic. Sure, That's logic. Kid. They don't that have Bernie the numbers Sanders to win. Bernie to those people. And Bernie Sanders didn't get elected because the DNC made it so that he couldn't get elected oh. because they are a... No. They, no, I was just going to say... Like, when people like... Um, uh, who's the, the the crazy Democrat that's running now as like an independent? JFK. Um, when Kennedy, Robert 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 Kennedy Jr. Jr. Like Kennedy, talk about the DNC being having a conspiracy against him. It's because they are. Just like they had a conspiracy to elect Hillary Clinton instead of Bernie some odd years ago. The DNC has made it unbearable it, for people like me who actually believe in the idea of democracy and a vote for a vote to continue to vote for them. We well, they want to get rid of the Electoral manipul- College. We so you- are. Be- no, by moving the vote wherever it needs to be. I agree with an- you. But yeah. you did mention, Bert- I agree with you. that The system is corrupt. But it is. We, and if you look at that superdelegate thing, so it's, it's, the DNC hold on. won't even allow us to have the candidate that we want, but you continue to throw your weight behind them. That's fine. That's a oh. choice that you can make. But I'm not going to give my money or time or energy to corruption. I why did do it. why did Bernie vote for Hillary and why did Bernie vote for Biden then? Because he's a politician at the end of the day. OK, so he, he's not the man that you said he was then. So why would you vote I for him and say that it was a shame he lost if he's a politician? He was, but he was the man that should have won. But he didn't, and he voted for Hillary because he, he gets it. Because the DNC made sure. But he voted for Hillary voluntarily. He voted for You're Biden voluntarily. The part that I'm talking about to go straight to the income, the outcome, as if the means I am agreeing with you. don't matter. But I'm agreeing with you. Bernie got duped. He got tricked. You just don't care. I do care. He won the nomination. I don't think he would have won in a general election. I don't think middle America, we have to get outside our bubble. It and that's what matter. I do. Democracy, that's what democracy looks like. But this is what I'm telling you. You think you're going to change it. You're not. I'm sorry. You want to believe in a world where you have feet, agency, but you don't. I, I well, hate well. it. You're, you're looking at me like I'm I'm forcing reality on you, but or that I love this reality. I hate that Bernie got cheated by the DNC. I hate that there's no open primaries on the Democratic side. I hate it all. It sucks. I agree with you. What I'm saying is, given all that, we can't change that in one year. All we can do is try to stop somebody that's more evil than the DNC and more evil than Trump. And that's Biden. That's all I'm saying. Again, it's not the weapon of choice. I agree with everything you're saying. I agree with your principles because we both have kids and we want a better world where it's equality and everybody gets taken care of. But it's gotten worse for women under Trump. It's gotten worse for minorities under Trump. It will get worse for minorities worse if we women don't. Under Clinton. It got worse for women over under Obama. It's gotten worse for women, period. But there is no third party candidate that has the numbers that can win a and that can change Republican behavior. Let me let me give Ron a chance to, 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 to step in here for a second. Yeah, but thank you. I, I love this spirited debate. I agree with everything you say. It's a it's a strategy. That's all. On principle, okay, I agree. OK, Ron, Ron, have you ever voted for a third party candidate? No. Thank um, you. I, I have not. And I have complained about third party candidates uh, quite a bit. Uh, and it's just because there isn't, in my opinion, a viable, there hasn't ever been a viable third party candidate. It sucks. And I don't, and I don't think, and I think the first time that I learned about third party candidates, I wasn't eligible to vote yet, which was like Ross Perot, right? Um, yeah. uh, what was that? 92? 92. But, but that's when I first started getting interested a little more in politics. Now I will say this. I mean, I did the whole thing where I'm going to create change. Like when I was in my mid twenties, I was vegan for four years. So I'm going to create change, and I'm like, well, this isn't realistic, you know. But I did have a, <laughs> I did have a thought recently, and I didn't follow through with this because I just couldn't bring myself to do this. And I don't know if this was a valid thought or not. But maybe you guys can help me. You know, I am now registered to vote in the state of Nevada, not California, and this will be my first election in Nevada. And Nevada is notoriously a gray state. California doesn't typically need my help. Nevada might, right? Mm -hmm. So I had the thought of registering Republican 
which I couldn't bring myself to do, but registering mm. for the purposes of the primary so I could vote somebody other than Trump towards the nomination, right? Mm -hmm. And then when it came time to the general, it doesn't matter what my affiliation is, I can still vote for Biden. That was my thought in trying to do like a small, tiny part to like keep Trump away and, and, and off the ballot at the general. Now, a lot of it, I also have this thought saying, oh, you think that that's actually gonna work? Uh, no, I actually don't think it's gonna work, but yeah, it's the little tiny thing that I can do. Um, I will always support, if we went back pretty much before I was eligible to vote, like let's go back to the 80s and the 90s, because uh, I think I was eligible to vote in 97, um, I would look at Republican and other candidates um, than Democrat, but they're not the same anymore. They are not the yeah. same anymore. No, and I do have these two choices. And like we've all been saying, it's dumb that we have only these two choices. But I'm going to go with whoever that uh, whatever that blue choice is uh, at, at, at these points. And if we are just doing apples and oranges with Trump and Biden, well, they're definitely going to go to Biden. I, I don't even know how people can argue that Trump did more in his four years than, than what Biden has and what the left has done. Um, but yeah, but that was my thought as far as being a new voter in Nevada is should I register Republican? And I think it's too late now, but for the primary so that I could vote somebody other than Trump. I couldn't bring myself to do that. Oh, who knows? I don't want to be famous in 20 years, possibly, and having people do a deep dive and like, hey, I'm so Republican. I'm like, no, that's cool. Don't have to explain that. But but that was my thought. And Did you see that story? Way that I can help. Did you, it's funny you mentioned like being famous in 20 years and people come back on you being a Republican. Did you see that story that, that Kelsey Grammer was on the BBC day before yesterday? And, you know, he's, he's Fraser's back in a reboot. Uh, on Paramount Plus, and uh, Kelsey Grammer is an interesting guy in that he he had some serious drug issues, both on on the sets of uh, Cheers. They had the, the cast had to have an intervention with him, oh and the same thing years later when he was doing Frasier, they had to do it again. He had some serious drug issues, and then he became right wing. Um, I interviewed him once, and he was a, a, a couple of election cycles ago, and he was supporting Michelle Bachman. Remember her crazy ass? You either he was support right wing or, or born again, or the, or both. I, I think right wing. I don't think born again. Right wing, it's and uh, and so so he was he was given an interview to the BBC and said he supported Trump. And uh, Paramount Plus's PR people came in and oh. shut the interview down immediately. I mean, just in me, because they say he was ready to go on and explain why he was supporting Trump and why we needed to support Trump. And they just, you know, yeah, they, they just they, they put the guy on the show. It. They, they put the guy on it. Yeah. But it's I, I, I understand. And I get where you guys are both coming from. And it's and it's been a fascinating spirit of debate. And I appreciate it. Thank you. And I see where you, where you I do. Seriously, I, I, I know that's what you're laughing, but it's true. It, 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 it I think it made for, it made for an interesting viewing. Um, but I see where you're both coming from, Ju you know, Justin, I, you don't want to just fall in line for the sake of falling in line and what you're saying, Carlos. And I will say, I, I, I tend to agree with Carlos that the Bernie's house going on, to vote for Biden. The house the is guy that fire. everybody loved Bernie Sanders who got cheated. He got cheated. Oh, that he whole super delegate thing was crap. He that got whole railroaded, but well, in the end, getting cheated now again, he, Biden should not just be handed the nomination. I agree. There's, there's a process. I this agree. This whole thing is corrupt. I Who could win? Who I could win right now? You, 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 do you think that you think Gavin Newsom could win? He's pretty polarizing, um, but I, 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 mean, Newsom, no. I don't think he could win. Yeah, Justin, really? I'm a hundred percent. Do I think he you. could win? Do I think Gavin Newsom? I actually do think Gavin Newsom. I think so too. Win. I think he's very good. Really at He has that kind of dick energy that we just <laughs> yeah. kind of respond to. Yeah. Um, it's true. I mean, Bill Clinton's an asshole. Trump's an asshole. We love assholes. We in love office. our country. Really loves do. assholes. Liberals like to pretend that we want some sort of peacenik in there. We don't. We don't. We do not at all. We don't. I, we I want, wish. We want I, that swinging dick energy. We've always loved it. I, I um, wish there was a candidate the, the, that could the, win. The piece that I will come back to, and again, Carlos, I know we're not going to find we're not we're not going to find common ground on this. Um, but we did find I, common I, ground I, in the it, cause. But but all all respect to you, and that, I don't say that in a flippant way. I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not, and you too, I'm being not, a parent. But this same energy, this we've got to do this because this is the outcome, because this will be the outcome, because this will be the outcome, is the same 
kind of argument I've heard my entire life from the right. No, from the right of we can't outlaw this gun. It means that we'll have to outlaw all guns. Yeah. We can't out, we can't allow this drug to be legal. It means all drugs will Still be pretty slow. And they make it's the slippery slope, but it's also the if we can't have a perfect outcome, we will have no outcome. If we can't get everything that we want, then we will have none of it. And it's that same kind of energy and argument that you're making of, hey, if you vote for a third party, which is there, it's part of the system. That is a legitimate thing for you to go mm -hmm. into. But if you do it. It will create this outcome, and because it creates this outcome, it has no value. I reject that argument wholeheartedly. It, it do, well, I'm not saying dogmatically. I'm saying numerically, scientifically, and mathematically. A vote that is not for Biden in the general in states that are close will, in fact, numerically jump over to Trump's side and help Trump the greater evil. That's math. That's science. That's not dogma. It has a value because you stand on your principles. I can't discount that. But it the effect of it, it mathematically moved the needle. Did you since Ralph Nader? How has the country gotten since voting for Ralph Nader? What did the Supreme Court get better or worse? Did Citizens United happen after or before voting for Ralph Nader? Again, that's kind of the argument of if we can't have the outcome that we want, then there's no value in what you're doing. And I reject that idea because that robs us of all of our choice. But the same it goes to robs us. I Go use the same argument. You're saying that if I can't have the perfect third party candidate that I that, that I don't want, then I will view pragmatism as complicity. And they're two separate things. Pragmatism is you know, making, we do that as parents, your kids, we can't give everything yeah, we want to our kids. Is nobody's looking at you on this call, Carlos, and saying you're selling out the country oh, by doing, doing. Believe me, I get attacked from Jimmy Dore, Graham Elwood people call me white privilege, too rich, not famous enough. Okay, well, I think that's crap too. I, well, I also, I know that it's crap, but I'm just telling you mathematically, that's all I'm saying is mathematically in states, there's what, five states that, that are going to decide it. Yeah, yeah, if it's close and the people who voted have a chance to vote for Biden to stop Trump, vote third party, that will help Trump. That's there are places where two, there That's are places where, two or three, there, there are places where a third party candidate taking two or like, three percent will, will make a difference. That's math. There, I, I, I hear you, Carlos, and I, I guess I forget who said it, but like the, the worst words in the English language are you're technically correct. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, no, in, in you know? terms of in terms of math, in terms of Gore losing by 500 votes and and Ralph Nader having the choice to go, you know what? I have no shot. Bush is an evil piece of shit. I don't love Gore. You should vote for Gore. That's kind of what I would have done as a candidate. I would have said, you guys, I got no shot. I'm not going to stay in this race because I hate Al Gore. The system is evil. But fucking Bush, we don't want that guy. So vote for Gore. Just do me. 500 of you do it. We'll, we'll, we'll regroup, we'll come back because voting third party in this election will get you further away from the goals that you want. It okay, really we're will. Out, we're, out, we're out of time, so I'm, I'm gonna give Justin the last word. Go ahead, Justin. I, I, I'm, there's, there's no, um, there's nothing more that needs to be said on, on either side of this. Instead, what I think would be most useful is Carlos has an, excellent set of points and you're you do too. incredibly well-spoken and eloquent and passionate and i 100 percent hear where you're coming from i don't agree with all of your points i appreciate your voice being out there i appreciate that you and i can get a little excited and raise our voices at each other and keep it relatively civil between comics <laughs> when <laughs> god knows it could have gone off the rails so spectacular oh, real easily Really There's no it? group of people that can go from loving each other to to uh, <laughs> quicker than a group of comedians. <laughs> um, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for having push uh, back and forth with me. Um, you and I want the same thing at yep. the end of the day, which is a wonderful future for our children. My son just turned 13. It is a wow, weird. He's 13 already. Scary. I know it's. We That's we could weird. talk about. We could talk about him and uh, for 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 hours. But look, 
He's an amazing, wonderful young man. Nobody wants a brighter future and a more positive outcome in the coming years and the coming election than myself, Carlos, people mm -hmm. who are um, raising the next generation. Uh, we have slightly different ways of getting there. But at the end of the day, I'm much more interested in the fact that we both want good things. And as for me, I'm going to move to Nevada and register Republican because I'm 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 with Ron and I, I, I want to do my part. So that way there'll be two votes. There will be two votes for somebody who's not Trump for the Republican primary. Hey, maybe who knows? God gets involved. One guy goes down. We could all vote for the same person. You know what I'm saying? Let's go, God. Do your thing. All right, exactly. wait, no, now to the right. thigh slapping part. Where are you guys playing, Carlos? You know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything live anymore. But I have a new show on Nickelodeon. We'll promote called Rock Paper Scissors with Tom Lennon and Ron Funches. Uh, that comes out next year. We can talk all about that. And every Wednesday morning on Stephanie Miller Radio Show, uh, three forty eight, three forty eight on Direct TV and or FreeSpeech dot org. All right, and you got a website, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a website, or you just follow me on the Twitters and watch my arguments with the Jimmy Dore guys. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> on the X's, not the yeah, Twitters. On the X's, whatever it's called. Ron. Um. You know, my December and January is really slow. So if anybody is watching this and they book things, call me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I have a lot coming up after that. And there's a new comedy club in Manteca called the Deaf Puppy Comedy Club, and I'm going to be headlining it February eighth to the tenth. So awesome. if you all want to take a um a trip. 40 years east, uh, go to Manteca. <laughs> 40 <laughs> years east. Headlining there. Uh, uh, T-shirt. February 8th to the 10th. Yeah. but um, and I, I hope that's there. wonderful. That space looks really cool. That could be really neat. It's really cool. And I think he's going to be doing good things. His shows were always yeah. very good in Manteca. So I think the club and bringing together like um, a good group of handicapped comics who have like a lot of opinions the way we do will be good. You know, for, for Manteca and uh, the space itself was supposed to be open and it hasn't opened yet. So he's been actually doing his shows in nearby venues in Manteca while while it's getting going. But I think in February it should be all uh, ready to go. So I should mention to people, I should mention to people, by the way, who are watching out of state, Man Manteca is in the Central Valley in California. So if you're if you're in Northern California, that's where Manteca is located. Go on, you were saying? And if you're out of state, no reason to go there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, and then find me online, ronvi.com, R-O-N-N-V-I-G-H.com. All right, Justin, where are you playing? Uh, let's see. Well, I want to start by saying that I did... Um... Last week, Don Reed has a new storytelling series that he's doing yes. um, in um, uh, up up near like the- In the Redwoods, Park. right? It's in the Redwoods. Yeah, in the Redwoods. I did it last week. Look, it was cold. We got about 20 people to like show up, but that space is like magical. So um, I'm not sure when he's doing the next one, but just everyone kind of keep your ear to the ground for that one because- He was on the podcast last week and he talked about it. Yeah, beautiful full bar, heaters everywhere. They bring blankets. You sit in the redwoods. Wonderful storytellers. It was just a cool show, and I want to see it continue. Um, my show coming up here in December is actually sold out, so there's no uh, point in that one. But um, in the new year, I'll be at Three Steve's Winery down south on January 5th. That's always a great show. Um, come see that. Down and south then, where? Doing, down south uh, where? That's Three, Three Steve's Winery. That's um, that's near the um, kind of like Livermore area. Okay, again, Northern uh, again, California. There are still tickets uh, available for that. And then I'll be at the Bankhead Theater in Santa Rosa on January seventeenth. That's also going to be a great show. So come see me there. All right. So come and support all of the guests to this podcast. Um, I got a couple of things I, I want to mention. Uh, I'm doing. It's going to be my... just Carlos and I yelling at each other for two hours. <laughs> actually, we out. should have an on. I, I want to do a live version of this actually in front of an audience. I'll do I'm it. I'm serious. Okay. Would you do it? I, I would love to do, do a live version of headliners in front. You know, just we'll keep it to four. Well, me and three others. I'll moderate and and do it in front of a live audience at a club somewhere. Yeah, and we don't uh, lack for passion. That's it's going to be record. all crowd work. All crowd work. Carlos and I yelling at each other. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Terrible. I will yeah. arrange that. 
Uh, I just want to mention, I, I am, it's, it's Christmas time and I have a, I have a, a Christmas solo show that I do every year called the jewelry box, uh, which is a family friendly show. It's a true story about when I was six years old. I want to buy my mom a jewelry box for Christmas and all the things as a six year old I had to do to earn the money. Uh, and I'm doing five performances of that, uh, here in the Bay area over the course of the next couple of weeks. This Saturday, I am in Alameda at the Altarina Playhouse, uh, next, uh, Next Friday, I'm at the Marsh in Berkeley. Saturday and Sunday, I am in uh, in San Leandro as part of the Best of San Francisco solo series. And then on the 23rd, I will be at the Marsh in San Francisco. So uh, for the information about those dates or anywhere else I'm playing, just go to briancopeland.com. Also something I'm, I'm mentioning here for the first time, I, I, don't, I don't know if you guys were on when I mentioned last time, during the uh, during the pandemic, I wrote a crime book. I wrote a, I wrote a crime fiction novel and uh, and it sold. And it's coming out, uh, it's called Outraged, and it comes out uh, on April 23rd. And right now, if you go on Amazon, pre-sales are available. And two days ago, I signed a contract for the sequel. Uh, it's not out yet, and they want a second one. So, uh, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be typing away for the next couple of months till I get a, get a copy. But uh, that's awesome. So, congratulations. Thank you. All right, so for, for right now, just uh, you know, go and and uh, uh, check it out. You know, go and and, and go to go to Amazon and and pre order for me. I'd appreciate it. All right, so so Ron, Carlos, Justin, again, a pleasure to have you always. Thank Thanks you so much for doing it. We're gonna do this live. We will definitely do this live. Let's do a live. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's going to do it for this week we'll check you out next week if you want to support the podcast people always ask how can we support it a couple of ways you can do it one is by uh, if you're listening to us go to whatever platform you're listening on give us a five star review that helps people to find us tell anybody you know any way that you possibly can about the podcast if you're watching us over YouTube please subscribe once we get a thousand subscribers we can do this live we don't have to record it and drop it the next day. We could do it live. So please uh, subscribe and get your friends to subscribe. Until next week, be kind to your neighbor. He knows where you live. I don't know what the hell that was. <laughs> yes.